On today's episode, the moon claims another victim, SpaceX has a new plan for Starship, and the Boeing Starliner experiences another setback. This week, a small lunar lander from Japan became the latest in a rapidly growing list of failed attempts to reach the surface of the moon, a once barren and desolate place that is quickly becoming a spacecraft graveyard. The ill-fated lander, known as Resilience, is from a Japanese startup called iSpace, and is part of their Hakuto-R series, one that has attempted a moon landing before and also met with disaster along the way. Resilience had been traveling from the Earth to the Moon for about five months before it was finally ready to complete its final approach. It actually launched on the same Falcon 9 rocket as another lander, the Firefly Blue Ghost. Leaving the Earth on January 15th, Blue Ghost took a more direct path to the Moon and ultimately became the most successful American lunar lander in decades. While Blue Ghost was making history, Resilience was taking a scenic route to the Moon. One focused on conserving energy and maximizing safety. It's a sound theory, but as space enthusiasts tuned in to watch the landing, what we saw was less than ideal. A little over one minute before the expected touchdown, telemetry disappeared from the on-screen display, leaving just an animation of the lander for us to watch. The animation continued for a few seconds before that too dropped out, and the camera cut to a live image of our flight director. He was sitting there with his hands on his face, and it was clear something had gone terribly wrong. The rest of the team also became very somber, and you could basically see the hope draining from their bodies. Some people stayed at their post looking through data while the rest paced around the room anxiously. It was only after the stream ended that any official word was given about the lander's fate, which came as no surprise. Resilience had been lost during the landing attempt and had smashed into the moon. While teams are still looking through data to find a definitive cause for the vehicle's failure, it's clear that something went wrong with the laser rangefinders aboard the craft. The rangefinders, which measure the distance from the surface to the moon using lasers, is essentially the same LiDAR technology that you'll find in many autonomous vehicles and robots. This sensor experienced a glitch where the rangefinders didn't return their measurements in time, which delayed essential data from being received by the flight computer. When the rangefinders eventually produced those measurements, it was too late, and resilience didn't have sufficient time to slow down, and it smashed into the moon at breakneck speeds probably something in the neighborhood of 50 meters per second. iSpace would describe this event as, quote, a hard landing. This failure would be unfortunate for any small company trying to reach the moon. However, it was especially bitter for iSpace, as this was their second attempt at the Silver Globe. Their first mission ended when the lander ran out of fuel while still high above the surface and made another, quote, hard landing. This is a real shame, because the Hakuto R lander is actually a very capable machine on paper. The lander has eight sides and almost resembles a rounded cube with solar panels. Hakuto R has seven engines beneath it, six of which are used for maneuvering and another for descent. This is held up by four wide landing legs. This flight, as well as the previous one, were both meant to prove Hakuto R as a viable landing system. Now, the future of the company and their design hangs in the balance. We can't help but think back to the Intuitive Machines IM2 mission earlier this year, also the second landing attempt for a small company with dreams of reaching the moon, and also experienced a hard landing that was largely blamed on a laser altimeter, which is interesting. By contrast, the Firefly Blue Ghost did not rely on a LiDAR system and instead used a camera vision-based AI algorithm for its primary navigation. Now obviously, Firefly will have to repeat their landing success to ultimately prove that it was more than just good fortune, but at the same time, repeatable failure would appear to show more than just bad luck. There is something wrong with the approach that most modern tech companies are taking when it comes to landing on the moon. Speaking of which, Elon Musk's SpaceX has ambitions to land their Starship rocket as far away as the planet Mars, and we've just got an interesting look at the company's new plan to meet that goal. 
Ultimately, the success of Starship is going to rely on an incredibly high volume of launches, which is going to require a large amount of infrastructure to be built here on the Earth. They need more launch pads, which in turn also have to support Starship landings as well, and the first step in accomplishing this will be to expand Starship operations from Texas to Florida. Of course, SpaceX is still very much in the process of figuring out how to fly their Starship successfully, but it seems like they aren't willing to wait to build an empire to support that rocket, if and when it does become operational. The FAA has just revealed that SpaceX plans to build not one, but two more Starship launch pads. However, these new pads won't be built at Starbase. For this, we have to move halfway across the country to Florida, where the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station is located. This is where SpaceX wants to convert an existing launch complex to a pad capable of supporting up to 76 launches a year, with a landing of both Starship and Super Heavy for each launch, adding up to 152 landings per year. The project involves constructing launch and landing pads, propellant storage, and other infrastructure, along with widening the Phillips Parkway to transport the rocket to the launch site. This is all coming from an FAA Draft Environmental Impact Statement for SLC-37. That's down south on the Cape from the main SpaceX launch site for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. That's Pad 39. Pad 37 was built in the early 1960s, and it was used to launch the Saturn 1 rocket as part of the early phase of Apollo hardware testing. Most recently, the pad was home to Boeing's Delta IV rocket from 2002 until its retirement in 2024. The FAA document outlines everything that SpaceX will change to the site, and gives a response on how each aspect will affect the environment. This includes the effect on nearby populations and how the sound or shockwaves might interfere with civilian lives. Outlined in the statement are four new structures that will be built. Two 600-foot launch towers, which will be 120 feet taller than the current towers SpaceX has built for Starship. This is likely so that the pads can accommodate the planned Starship Block 3, which will be significantly taller than Block 1 and Block 2. These two massive towers will differ from SpaceX's current Mechazilla, as they won't catch every vehicle that comes back to land. This is where the other two structures will come in. Two 225-foot round pads will be built with their own sets of chopsticks for additional catch capabilities. These will likely be shorter and made specifically for the Starship upper stages, which will require a longer refurbishment process and won't be immediately returned to the launch mount like the Super Heavy booster. There will be a third option for landing rockets at this new construction as well, however, it is less at the pad and more off the coast next to the pad. Super Heavy will also have the capability of landing offshore on remote drone ships or it can be expended into the water for maximum flexibility. SpaceX will obviously build most of this infrastructure locally in Florida to avoid transportation costs. However, the same can't be said about the rockets they will actually be launching. The statement outlines how SpaceX will transport Starship and Super Heavy boosters from Starbase Texas to Florida before production facilities are operational at the Cape. The rockets will be laid down horizontally and placed on barges for transportation through the waters between the two states. This will likely require development of new systems to stand up the boosters and ships, as Starship has never been laid down and is built in a vertical orientation. We'd previously believed that Starship couldn't be laid down on its side for structural reasons, but we also know that SpaceX has spent a lot of time reinforcing the body of the rocket to make it more rigid with each iteration. Either way, this will be a challenging operation. However, since the entire Starship system is supposed to be reusable, once they have a backlog of ships and a couple of boosters at the coast, they can stop transporting them and instead focus on building them locally. The big question is why doesn't SpaceX just use the launch complex they already are leasing at the Cape? Not only that, but the site where they launch Falcon 9 already has a Starship launch pad constructed. Will that be scrapped for these new towers? Well, for an answer, you have to take into consideration the constant Falcon 9 launches taking place at LC-39A, the location of SpaceX's Florida Starship launch pad. SpaceX eventually will phase out Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy for Starship, 
but it won't happen anytime soon, and as of now, Falcon is still the most frequently launched rocket in the world. SpaceX will still use the pad at 39A, they just don't want to interfere by trying to scale it up to 76 additional launches a year on top of 100 or more Falcon liftoffs. The other option they had was to develop an entirely new launch site at Cape Canaveral known as SLC-50, but this was less desirable, as SLC-37 is currently leased by ULA but hasn't been used since the recent retirement of Delta IV Heavy which means it is already equipped with expensive hardware that could be carried over to Starship. The FAA environmental statement is just a draft currently, and first has to go to public comment and then get approved, but it looks like SpaceX is closer than ever to moving Starship to the Cape. As SpaceX continues to grow, one of its biggest rivals seems to be having trouble getting off the ground after it faced issues over the last year. This week we got some long-awaited news on the Boeing Starliner spacecraft, but that news left the future of the spacecraft even more uncertain, with a next flight no longer planned for this year. NASA released a statement discussing this, saying, quote, NASA is assessing the earliest potential for a Starliner flight to the International Space Station in early 2026, pending system certification and resolution of Starliner's technical issues. This leads us to believe that the leaks that were discovered a year ago during Starliner's flight weren't the only issues with the spacecraft. There were possibly other problems that needed fixing which caused the delay. It is still unclear whether the next flight will include people on board. NASA said again, quote, The agency is still evaluating whether Starliner's next flight will be in a crew or cargo configuration. Either way, it's expected to no longer be considered a test flight. It could possibly be rebranded as a new type of cargo-only Starliner flight, or if it is certified for the crew, then it could possibly become Starliner's Crew-1. The astronauts that will fly on Crew-1 have not all been assigned yet, which means that it's less likely to be a crewed mission. This will be heavily determined by the result of upcoming engine tests, which will certify the vehicle. The thrusters on Butch and Sonny's flight last summer had significant issues with five of its engines cutting out and one never coming back. That's why engine reliability is something they desperately need to prove. On top of this, they also must prove that the spacecraft will no longer leak and strand astronauts at the space station.